Now raise your hand if you think that close to 50 milligrams of turinabol is going to give you the same amount of muscle mass, cosmetic appeal, roundness, fullness, hardness, density as rounded down 40 milligrams of oxandrolone. Yeah, I didn't think so. Vigorous Steve here, back with the Epic Steroid Battles of History video series. And in this video, we're going to compare Anavar to Turinabol. This is a comparison that many of you guys have requested in the comment section of the previous steroid battle video, where we compared Primabolin to Boldenone. Now, in that comparison, I felt all things considering from my personal experience and that with clients, I felt that Primabolin came out on top. And in this video, we're going to do the exact same thing. I'm going to go over the quick facts, discuss my personal experience and that with clients, and compare Anavar to Turinabol head on. Now, personally, I've used Anavar and Turinabol separately in the past. I prefer Anavar myself, but there's always a little bit of contextual use. Anavar is typically used during a cutting phase, and Turinabol is typically used somewhere during the off-season to push past strength plateaus. I feel that both compounds are slightly interchangeable because some of the effects regarding strength and the growth of new muscle tissue are pretty similar, as are the cosmetic changes. But the dosing protocol is going to be significantly different between both compounds. So even though I prefer Anavar over Turinabol personally, I still recommend both compounds depending on the goals of the client. Keep in mind, I never recommend Turinabol to women. I didn't mention Turinabol specifically in the Safe Performance Enhancing Drugs uh, for Women in that video series that I posted recently. If you haven't watched it, you can watch it here. I don't feel that Turinabol is safe for women in any way, shape or form. I would recommend Turinabol to men, but never to women. So please keep that in mind going forward. If you're thinking about using any of these compounds and you're a woman, well, Anavar wins in this comparison, so you can exit this video and maybe watch that Safe Performance Enhancing Drugs for Women video series instead. If you're a dude, stick around, you might learn something new. And before we get into it, please like the video, leave a comment for the algorithm, and consider subscribing if you haven't already. Now for men, the Anavar dose and the Turinabol dose, I would say Anavar can be run at half the amount of Turinabol for comparable increases in strength and cosmetic changes. We'll get into a little bit more in depth when we do the head-on comparison uh, based on the molecular weight. But for now, I would say that if you're in a caloric surplus and you use Anavar or Turinabol during the off-season, you would need to double the dose of Turinabol to get comparable effects of what you are getting with Anavar, assuming it's legit Anavar, pharmaceutical grade or accurately dosed underground lab Anavar and being the active pharmaceutical ingredient. But if you were using Anavar during a cutting phase and calories are significantly restricted towards the end, you might need to increase the dose of Turinabol a threefold to get comparable effects. So let's say you got good results from 20 milligrams of Anavar per day, for example, then to get comparable results, you would need to run 60 milligrams of Turinabol. Again, calories contribute to how much anabolism you can facilitate when you're on performance enhancing drugs. And if you're on Anavar or Turinabol during an off season, the dose discrepancy is a little bit less because you're eating more calories than when you're eating less calories during a cutting phase. So you have to keep that in mind. And when we do a head on head comparison a little bit later, well, you know, it's safe to say that Anavar is going to win um, when the dosages are pretty much the same. Let's get a couple quick facts out of the way and then we'll start comparing these compounds head on. The chemical name of Anavar is Oxandrolone. It's a 17 alpha alkylated derivative of dihydrotestosterone. Oxandrolone, or Anavar, was first introduced in 1962 and approved for medical use in 1964. Anavar was produced by Cyril Laboratories. Anavar was discontinued by Cyril Laboratories in 1989 and then the patent was transferred to Biotechnology General Corporation, which later changed its name to Savient Pharmaceuticals. So Savient owns the license to produce Anavar, but there are several different other companies which also produce pharmaceutical grade Oxandrolone. 
Savian Pharmaceuticals performed additional clinical trials, which were concluded in 1995, and then released their own Oxandrolone under the brand name Oxandrin, which are available in 2.5 and 10 milligram tablets. So pharmaceutical grade Anavar hasn't been around since the 1990s, but many of the underground labs have adopted the Anavar name and now produce Anavar containing Oxandrolone or something entirely different. And then it's available on the black market. So whatever Anavar you find nowadays is underground labs. Oxandrolone is still being produced in pharmaceutical settings. Compounding pharmacies in the United States produce Oxandrolone tablets in 10 milligram, 25 milligram, or even 50 milligram doses, which I feel is a little bit too high. So you'd need to either dissolve a 50 milligram Oxandrolone tablet in Everclear and then dose that with a syringe if you want a five milligram serving. But of course, a 10 milligram tablet is easy to split if you're a female and you only want five milligrams Oxandrolone uh, during your contest prep. Oxandrin is produced by Savient Pharmaceuticals. Oxandrolone is still being produced by Upshur, Smith Laboratories and Par Pharmaceuticals. Iran Hormone Pharmaceuticals produces Deroloxon, which you might be able to find, um, you know, if you have a good hookup. And then here in Thailand, Body Research produces Bonavar, which is not FDA approved in Thailand itself. If you go to the Thai FDA database for medicines and drugs, Bonavar containing Oxandrolone is not listed in this database, but it's produced by a company that produces uh, steroid products, which are FDA approved. So it's produced in a pharmaceutical facility, which has the capability to produce pharmaceuticals, which are FDA approved locally. Oxandrolone is currently FDA approved in the medical treatment of alcoholic hepatitis to aid in the development of girls suffering from Turner syndrome, to counteract HIV or AIDS induced muscle wasting, and to offset protein catabolism caused by long-term administration of corticosteroids. And there's also off-label medical use of Oxandrolone in particular special settings. For example, to promote weight gain after surgery or physical trauma. So that's in cases of sarcopenia, where muscle wasting occurs due to surgery or immobilization. Anavar is, uh, or Oxandrolone is prescribed for off-label use, right? You have the clinical uh, FDA-approved use. And then in cases of these particular medical settings, Oxandrolone might still be prescribed to resolve a particular health condition. So one of that is to promote weight gain after surgery. Another one is uh, during chronic infections or to treat bone pain and wasting associated with severe osteoporosis. Now, since 2016, Oxandrolone has also been prescribed off-label to quicken recovery of severe burns. So that's actually quite recent. And some of the other off-label treatments where Oxandrolone might be prescribed in special cases include the treatment of idiopathic short stature, anemia, hereditary angioedema, and even hypogonadism. But keep in mind that for some of these conditions, nowadays there are more preferred alternative treatments. For example, in cases of Turner syndrome or idiopathic short stature in children, growth hormone therapy is now preferred. The clinical dose of Oxandrolone varies between 2.5 to 20 milligrams daily, spaced out over two administrations if needed. Now, a fun fact about Oxandrolone is that it contains an extra oxygen atom uniquely over all the other anabolic to androgenic steroids we can choose from. So Oxandrolone is the only one with an extra oxygen atom, which replaces a carbon atom at the C2 position of the A-ring. And this extra oxygen atom in Oxandrolone prevents metabolism through the 3-alpha-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase enzymes, which are present in skeletal muscle, raising its overall anabolic potential. And this is reasonably unique to oxandrolone, requiring a much lower dose compared to most of the other anabolic androgenic steroids um, that are sustainable to be used long term. So, of course, if you compare Anavar to halotestin, well, dosage might be comparable. And then halotestin regarding the uh, growth of muscle tissue and the strength gain, halotestin will come out on top. But halotestin is not very sustainable compound and neither are check drops. Um, those compounds people usually run for maybe two weeks at most, three weeks if you really want to push it. And oxandrolone at lower dosages are very effective for prolonged periods of time with 
not too many negative changes on your blood work and certainly no um, horrible appetite or jaundice, which might occur with a prolonged halo test and exposure. There's some clinical evidence that oxandrolone significantly decreases thyroid binding globulin, raising free thyroid concentrations in the bloodstream and thus boosting metabolism potentially. But from my personal experience, I don't really see that play out in the real world or I don't see any altered metabolism or increased fat loss by the inclusion of oxandrolone in a cutting cycle, whether that's at five milligrams, 25 milligrams or 50 milligrams per day. I don't really see a negative or positive impact on thyroid hormones when doing blood work before and after. What I do notice is that oxandrolone blocks mineral corticoid or glucocorticoid receptors, in particular body fat areas, allowing you to get a little bit leaner in that area. So more specifically, people have a little bit of stress fat in the lower abs. They might be able to resolve that a little bit more efficiently with oxandrolone, which potentially blocks the mineral corticoid and the glucocorticoid receptors of the fat cells in that particular area. So a lot of anecdotal evidence where people report the use of oxandrolone is able to shrink fat, the, the stress pouch, as some people like to call it, on their lower app. So in that sense, it's beneficial, but I've never really seen um, significant changes in thyroid function with the inclusion of oxandrolone. Let's get into turinabol. The chemical name of turinabol is chlorodehydromethyltestosterone, which abbreviates to CDMT. Now, this name is impossible to remember, so let's just call it turinabol going forward. Turinabol is a 17 alpha alkylated testosterone derivative with a 4 chloro structure attached to a deanabol base. This, uh, this is how it was designed. They wanted to develop an anabolic androgenic steroid without any androgenicity. So this is the only true anabolic steroid in existence, specifically designed that it doesn't have any androgenic effects in the body. Now, this is only on paper. I don't think that Turinabol has been put through a hirsch uh, assay to determine its anabolic to androgenic rating. So there are some um, anecdotal reports that the androgenicity might be somewhere around 6 from what I understand, but its anabolic rating is around 100 or maybe even higher. Again, it hasn't been examined in rats using the levator ani and ventral prostate method of analysis. So the anabolic to androgenic rating of Turinabol is merely on paper. Turinabol was introduced and patented in 1961 and approved for medical use in 1965. It was produced and designed by Genefarm. And again, I don't think there was any medical or clinical use of Turinabol in East Germany during that time. Turinabol was merely developed by Genefarm to help athletes cheat and win at the Summer and Winter Olympics. Now, this doping program, known as the State Plan Topic 14.25, was in place until the GDR, the German Democratic Republic, collapsed in 1989. And after all of that became public knowledge, Genefarm decided to discontinue Turinabal production in 1994. Then in 1996, Shearing acquired Genefarm, and then later Shearing merged with Bayer, but both companies decided not to reintroduce Turinabol for medical use. So Turinabol is not produced in pharmaceutical settings since 1994, and all of the Turinabol that's available on the market is all underground lab quality. Now, Bayer Shearing still produces steroids in the form of Remabolin or Testovirin or Nabido or uh, Proviron, right? Proviron. So they're still producing steroids, but not Turinabol, which is a shame because I feel that it's a very helpful compound depending on which phase you're in. So again, medical use where you don't really have so much data, in which case uh, Turinabol was prescribed in the treatment of particular medical conditions. Um, all the information leads towards that this compound was specifically designed for athletes to beat the drug test and to uh, help with athletic performance. And that's how you should look at it. Turinabol is a steroid for athletic performance. It's one of its unique characteristics. Many people that use Turinabol notice that they get in increased endurance or increased athletic performance which is highly desired by bodybuilders when they're in the off-season. 
as you're gaining more muscle size and your body weight goes up, performance and endurance generally goes down. And turinabol might be able to offset that to a certain extent. Now, it highly depends on which other compounds you're running in the stack. If you're doing a combination of testosterone and boldenone, which is also known to increase somatocrit levels and boost performance, then I feel that testosterone, boldenone, and turinabol are a highly synergistic and complementary protocol for the off-season. Whereas during a cutting phase, a stack of testosterone, primobolin, and anivar would be highly synergistic for cosmetic purposes and to increase collagen synthesis, which all three are known to do, albeit that primobolin and anivar are far more suitable for collagen synthesis than testosterone does. So in terms of stacking, that's how I would approach it depending on which phase you're in. And now we got the history and the quick facts out of the way, and we can finally start comparing Anivar to Turinabol head on. The molecular weight of Anivar is 306.446 Daltons, and the molecular weight of Turinabol is 334.88 Daltons. The molar mass is the same number, but it's gram per mole. And we don't want grams, we want milligrams. So we're going to take one thousandth of a mole using the Avocadro's constant. A one thousandth of a mole is 6.0221476 times 10 to the power 20 molecules or rounded to 602.2 quintillion molecules. We're going to make a direct comparison. 602.2 quintillion and of our molecules compared to 602.2 quintillion turinabol molecules. And to make a direct head-on molecule for molecule comparison, we would need to compare 306.446 milligrams anivar per week to 334.88 milligrams turinabol per week. So that boils down to 43.8 milligrams anivar per day or 47.8 milligrams Turinabol per day, 43.8 milligrams anivar versus 47.8 milligrams turinabol. Now raise your hand if you think that close to 50 milligrams of turinabol is going to give you the same amount of muscle mass, cosmetic appeal, roundness, fullness, hardness, density as rounded down 40 milligrams of oxandrolone. Yeah, I didn't think so. 40 milligrams anivar is far superior than 50 milligrams turinabol. And like I mentioned before, if you want to make a fair comparison, you would have to dose turinabol about twice as high as anivar. And that's purely from what I see in the field. Anecdotal evidence from yours truly, my experience and that with clients, anivar is usually half the dose of that of turinabol if you want comparable results in the off season. And turinabol might be three times higher during cutting phase when calories are restricted. So it's a little bit wishy-washy comparison, but I'm going to do my best with double the dose of turinabol to anivar and a comparable dose based on this avocado's constant of 1,000 of a mole. Now, when we do a quick cost comparison on these dosages, you see that the daily expenses are pretty much the same. 100 tablets of 10 milligrams Anivar generally costs about $100 on the underground lab scene. We're both using underground prices because, again, Anivar is available as a pharmaceutical, but Turinabol is not. So I did a little bit of a quick market analysis. Generally speaking, 100 tablets of 10 milligrams Anivar cost about $100, and 100 tablets of 10 milligrams Turinabol cost about $80. Now, I could be off. Maybe you can get it way cheaper. Maybe you're spending a lot more. But I looked at the same sources and just took the average. $100 for Anivar, $80 for Turinabol. So that means 40 milligrams Anivar. I mean, you'll never be able to dose 43.8 milligrams Anivar, plus it's uh, significantly more potent on a milligram for milligram basis. So we're going to round the Anivar down and round the Turinabol up. 40 milligrams Anivar daily costs you $4 based on this uh, price analysis. And 50 milligrams Turinabol will cost you $4 also. So if you have $4 per day to spend, would you run 40 milligrams Anivar or 50 milligrams Turinabol? Yeah, I agree, Anivar, hands down. So if you want to have an equal effect regarding the accrual of muscle tissue and overall anabolism, and you would run twice the dose of Turinabol as Anivar, 
Now, let's say you reduce the dose of Anavar to um, 25 milligrams. Now, you're spending $2.50 and you're running 50 milligrams of Turinabol. Now, you're spending $4. So, now Anavar is cheaper at a lower dose. And, and potentially, a lower dose of Anavar has less burden on your liver, your lipids, and all that other stuff. It's already a no-brainer, in my opinion. Let's move over to the anabolic to androgenic rating, which is a little bit of an outdated metric to assess the potency and side effect potential of anabolic to androgenic steroids. But hey, it's scientific evidence, so we might as well go over it. The anabolic rating of Anavar is 322 to 630, which is a huge range of anabolic potential, and its androgenic rating is 24. And like I mentioned before, Turinabol has an anabolic rating of 100 plus and an androgenic rating of zero. Again, this is on paper, and I believe it hasn't been examined in an Hirschberg's assay. So when you look at that, well, Anavar wins hands down again. A lot of anabolic potential, potentially six times more than Turinabol on a milligram for milligram basis, and minimal androgenicity. So that allows you to run a low dose and not have that much risk of virilization considering its anabolic potential on a milligram for milligram basis. And that makes it safe for women, in my opinion, and all the women that I've recommended Anavar to, no virilization at low dosages of 2.5 to 5 milligrams per day. Now, might there still be virilization at 10 milligrams or an exposure over a lifetime of 5 milligrams of xanderlone per day? Probably. Right? It's, you still get virilization over time, even if the dosages are moderate. Now, even though Turinabol has no androgenic rating, all the anecdotal reports that I've heard, even at low dosages of 5 milligrams, um, when used by women, show signs of virilization, even with shortened exposure duration. So, I don't think Turinabol is uh, female-friendly at all. Let's compare some of the side effects. Acne. I would say that both compounds, both Anavar and Turinabol, do not potentiate that much acne. But some people notice acne on Anavar, specifically on their arms, which doesn't happen with guys running Anavar at older age. I've never heard older guys run Anavar and then say, I got some acne on my upper arm. That usually happens with the younger guys. And again, with acne, there's a lot of cofactors. You know, are you uh, slamming a ton of shakes? Uh, a lot of dairy products, uh, hygiene, and, uh, you're running around uh, or rolling around on a mat, you know, you're doing MMA, for example, right? All these things contribute into acne, um, but I see that some younger guys experience acne on Anavar and older guys do not. Is that due to fake Anavar? Potentially, right? We don't know. There are, most of the people use underground lab Anavar and the prices of Anavar of the raw powder is significantly higher than Turinabol. And, you know, maybe it's the anabol that you're running, right? Potentially. But from my personal experience, Anavar and Turinabol does not induce any acne for me. And I'm a pretty acne-prone guy. I would get acne from uh, Primabolin. I get acne from testosterone. But adding Anavar to testosterone as a base, I don't experience any more acne than I would otherwise get from the testosterone itself. Gyno. None present. Anavar and Turinabol don't metabolize into estrogen or methyl estradiol, so that's not something you have to worry about. They're not known to raise or lower serum estradiol concentrations, but being uh, Anavar, being a dihydrotestosterone derivative, is known to lower sex hormone binding globulin levels. You see that with Turinabol, but not as much as Anavar. So Anavar, I would say. On an effective dose, let's say 20 milligrams Anavar and 40 milligrams Turinabol, I would say that Anavar lowers sexual hormone binding globulin more. And if you were to combine that on the molecule dose, taking 43.8 milligrams Anavar versus 47.8 milligrams Turinabol, then well, Anavar would still lower sexual hormone binding globulin more than Turinabol does. So keep that in mind. You don't want to take too much Anavar where you're plummet your sex hormone binding globulin levels because that might ultimately affect your libido and the potential for anabolism potentiated through the sex hormone binding globulin receptor complex increasing cyclic adenosine monophosphate concentrations in skeletal muscle contributing to anabolism also hair loss 
I would say Anavar is not hair safe. A lot of people claim that Anavar is hair safe, but from all the people that I've talked to over the years, people suffering from androgenetic alopecia, they ran Anavar and they start shedding. And it's the same for Terinabol. Even though it's a testosterone derivative, it has no potential to convert into dihydrotestosterone. Um, you know, you would say that the four chloro structure would not potentiate any hair loss. But again, from anecdotal reports, both Anavar and Terunabol potentiate hair loss. Dianabol might be the only oral which is potentially hair safe. Personally, I don't suffer from any hair loss or androgenic alopecia. I have some gray hairs and that's it. So um, I can run Anavar and Terunabol and not experience any shedding. But if you're prone to it, you might want to stay clear of both compounds or it's um, a risk to reward trade-off and you get these nasty shin splitting pumps on a suitable dose of Anavar, Terinabol, and the shedding. Well, it is what it is. Mental changes. I would say Anavar in a caloric deficit might induce mild irritability, same as Primabolin. And Terinabol, mental changes during the off season would actually make you feel good, energetic. Um, and in that sense, if you're an Anavar during the off season, you don't get this feel good feeling that you would get from Terinabol or Dianabol. And if you run Turinabol during a cutting phase, you would probably experience the same mild irritability as Anavar. Maybe slightly less, hard to pinpoint. Um, so in that sense, Turinabol wins because it's a feel-good compound. Not as feel-good as uh, Dianabol during the off-season, but it does put you in a good mood for my experience. Again, calories also put me in a good mood, but if I add Anavar during the off-season, I might still experience a little bit mild irritability. So... And in this sense, uh, from the mental changes, I would say Terinabol is more suitable. Hematocrit, both compounds are minimal, even though Anavar is prescribed in cases of anemia. This is off-label prescription. So it might be able to potentiate an increase in hematocrit, but I think I don't see so much changes in hematocrit because the dosing of Anavar is generally moderate, assuming that the Anavar is real. So dosages of 20 milligrams to 25 milligrams are common. Some people run 50 milligrams per day, so that's 350 milligrams per week. And even then, I don't see so many changes in hematocrit. Now, even though Terunabol does improve endurance and athletic performance to a certain extent, it also appears not to raise hematocrit levels dramatically, certainly not to the point that primabolin or boldenone or even trembolone are known to do. So I would say minimal changes in hematocrit, but if you're prone to a lot of uh, erythropoiesis, let's say you're going a testosterone base and hematocrit shoots up, then surely adding in the anavar or the terinavol would might push that to the next level, making you do frequent blood donations or therapeutic phlebotomies. Blood pressure. I would say minimal. Maybe terinavol gets a little bit more blood pressure issues in comparing the same uh, dosages or effective dosages. I would say Turinable might induce blood pressure a little bit more, but that's also because people generally run higher dosages and they use it during the off season when you're eating a ton of food and um, right, carrying a lot more body weight and body fat levels around potentially. Reduction in serum uh, estradiol levels, I don't really see it uh, on therapeutic or comparative dosages of Anavar and Turinable, certainly not to the extent that Primabon or Boldenone can lower estradiol levels. Worsening of lipids, skewing the HDL-LDL ratio and increasing cholesterol levels. Uh, Anavar is certainly more potent in that regard from an effective dose perspective. So again, 25 milligrams Anavar versus 50 milligrams Terinabol. Your lipids will be worse from everything that I've seen on Anavar. And of course, if you compare 43.8 milligrams to Anavar to 47.8 milligrams Terinabol, then the lipids will certainly be worse. On Anavar, you'll also get better results. So again, it's a trade-off. Vascularity. In a cutting phase, Anavar wins. In an off-season phase, Terinabol wins. So yeah, it, it depends a little bit. If you take Anavar during the off-season, you will certainly be the most vascular, assuming that your body fat levels are the lowest. And if you take a comparable effective dose of Terinabol compared to Anavar during a cutting phase, vascularity will not be that pronounced. You'll still have low vascularity. Now, of course, the vascularity doesn't compare as much to boldenone during the off-season when vascularity can be uh, quite legendary. Um, but I would say that 
if you use anivor, let's say 25 milligrams anivor during a cutting phase, the vascularity might be identical to running 50 milligrams turinabol during an off-season phase. So if you're going for vascularity, both compounds will do. Of course, if you're running 40 milligrams anivor, that will beat the vascularity in any case over the 50 milligrams turinabol. Cosmetic changes. Anivar hands down, even five milligrams Anivar per day will make a noticeable difference. You'll probably need to run 10 to 20 milligrams of Turinabol to notice comparable cosmetic changes as a five milligram Anivar dose. Muscle tissue, Anivar hands down at any dose or any comparison, even half the dose of Anivar compared to double the dose of Turinabol, you probably still build more muscle tissue on the anivar. Again, it has a lot of potential for collagen synthesis and that's required to build new muscle tissue. And it's the same with strength. Anivar, in any comparison, unless you really hammer the turinable up to 100 milligrams per day and keep the anivar moderate at 25 milligrams per day or effective, I feel that 25 milligrams anivar per day is the effective dose for most people. Man, you would really need to bump up the turinable to get comparison, uh, comparable strength increases. So, vascularity anivar, cosmetic changes anivar, muscle tissue or accrual and building of new muscle tissue anivar, increase in strength anivar. But that doesn't mean turinable has no place in bodybuilding. Uh, quite the opposite is true. Both anivar and turinable are highly, highly beneficial. And if you only had the choice to run Two compounds, as a beginner, I would choose Anivar and Turinable. I mostly recommend Turinable as the first oral steroid that people look into um, when they get introduced to steroids. So let's say you do your first cycle, you get some experience with testosterone first, you might add in the ACG later to sustain testicular function and keep libido solid and neurosteroid functioning uh, going properly during the duration of your cycle. And then when you're ready for an oral, for example, you would add in turinable first because it's not commonly faked. Um, you don't get an adverse reaction at a lower dose, or at least not from what I see. And it increases uh, performance and may boost endurance. And of course, when you go on your first cycle, most people gain weight rapidly. And that unique characteristic of turinable is then desired. So you can acclimatize a little bit to this ever-increasing body weight. And of course, you should be doing cardio, perhaps look into GW1516 or anything else that can improve athletic performance during your first cycle. But man, Turinable, like for beginners, is a no-brainer, really. And even for more experienced people, let's say you do an off-season with slight amount of Turinable, right? You're at that advanced level where you're running a gram of tests, you know, boatload of calories, and you sprinkle in like a, a, a low innocuous dose of Turinable for all the nutrient partitioning benefits, right? And increase anabolism on top of the uh, testosterone base. So let's say 50 milligrams trend, 75, 100, 125, whatever trembolon dose of preference, the maximum tolerable dose where you start to notice a little bit of a performance reduction in windedness, maybe add a little low dose of uh, turinable on top to offset this reduction in performance and endurance that trembolone is now inducing. During a cutting phase, there's nothing else like Anivar. Can you run Turinabol during a cutting phase? Yes, absolutely. But you will not get all of the benefits, even at double the dose, triple the dose that Anivar will provide regarding the vascularity, the cosmetic changes, the pres preservation or even growth of new muscle tissue while you're in a steep caloric deficit. A Turinabol can replace it up until a certain point. But really, when you go uh, you know, deep in your diet, you need to run some proper Anivar, really. That will make a world of difference and Turinabol will merely keep you going. So I feel that Turinabol is a suitable first cycle compound, beginner compound, or an off-season compound. And I feel that Anivar is a suitable compound always, almost in every scenario, unless you're experiencing hair loss and your lipids are horrible before you start uh, dabbling with the Anivar, but I feel that Anivar is so versatile. Men, women, cutting phase, off-season, bridging even a low dose of Anivar, because it really, uh, five milligrams per day doesn't change your lipids and liver enzymes that much. It's, um, 
yeah, it's a very versatile compound. And I would, if I would have to make a choice for the rest of my life, if I can only choose one oral steroid, Anivar. End of story. I'll leave it at that, guys. Hope it was not too long. Hope you learned something new. Hope this video helps you in your decision making process going forward. I like both compounds, albeit in particular circumstances. Let me know which epic steroid battle you would like to see next. Let me know down below in the comment section. I will get to work and prepare some material. Again, these videos take a little bit longer to prepare, so I'll try to do as many as possible, at least one per week. If you're looking for the most comprehensive guides to bodybuilding pharmacology, you can find the ebooks on my website, vigorousteve.com slash shop. Personalized advice, always available through consultations. You can find the rates in the consultations section. Follow me on Instagram at vigorousteve. Have a look at my link tree where all the affiliates and all my sponsors are listed. Front double bicep for the vigorous crew. No anivar in this picture yet. But maybe after blood work, a couple of weeks from now, I will sprinkle in five milligrams Anivar per day and take this front double bicep to the next level. Thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.